Well, is he worthy? Um, absolutely he is. Of all, he's the only one worthy of our worship and our praise, right? Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to our study of Mark. I uh, um, hope that uh, everybody is online who wants to be online with our, our new platform, but I uh, heard nothing but good things from Sunday night, so that is our prayer that uh, everything is as it should be this evening. So without any further ado, let's jump right in and ask the Lord's blessing on our time tonight, and then we will um, start right away with uh, where we are, pick up where we are in the ninth chapter of Mark. So pray with me. Our dear Lord, as we continue to um, delve into this story of, of Jesus uh, casting out this demon, and particularly tonight, um, we pray that we would maybe step back from the story and take a look at it from a different perspective, that we would see the many, many different uh, um, living parables, uh, stories that not only uh, are historical and show us the power and the glory of, of the way Jesus um, used the power of God to explain to us the the glory of, of the redemption that he came to bring. And I pray that that will be made evident tonight as we continue this, um, this scene, this story that occurred at the base of the mountain where the transfiguration occurred so, um, so a few hours before. And we'll just give you the glory for that, dear Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, uh, just to remind you all where we are, um, you know that we are in the ninth chapter of Mark. We're, oh, right about the 23rd, 4th, and 5th verses and making our way through to the 29th verse uh, tonight, uh, hopefully, uh, at least pretty close, to the end of this particular story of Jesus coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration where His glory is revealed and God reveals His his uh, a favor that is upon him. We talked about that favor uh, on Sunday um, several times, the, the grace that God gives upon his son, not a grace that uh, is undeserved merit, but a grace that is favor, a, a grace that is his pleasure in his son. And of course, that's what he says from the cloud that overshadows the disciples up there, that this is my son my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him, pay attention to what he has to say. Also pay attention to what he does. And that's really what's gonna happen when he gets down to the base of the mountain and sees his disciples, the other nine disciples, who weren't up there on top, um, uh, struggling with some Pharisees over the fact that <laughs> a man with this uh, demon-possessed son has come and they were not able to cast it out. We're going to return to that because after all this is over, after this scene is completed, the disciples are going to ask Jesus, well, why couldn't we throw this particular demon out? And, and we'll see what Jesus' response is. But before we get there, I want to finish up the actual scene before us. And let me put it to you uh, uh, this way. Let, let's kind of uh, start describing it in not just the historical language, but the symbolic language. Here we have a, a human being, a, a boy, a man, a, a young man who is possessed by a very powerful, ugly um, uh, demon who has um, uh, is in the process of destroying him, uh, throwing him into the water, throwing him into the fire, ruining his life, uh, uh, totally consuming him. And apparently after he ruins this life, he'll probably go out and find another one to ruin because that's that, what these demonic creatures, these spirits do. And so he's demon possessed. And we've talked quite a bit about that demon possession and what it looks like and how is it possible for a human being to be possessed? Where, what, what relationship does the devil and his minions have upon those who are saved? We know that they're, they hold captive those who are not. But then um, uh, Jesus throws this demon out of, uh, of the, the boy. I'm going to continue to call him a boy, although we really don't know his age throws the demon out of the boy, and, and, and that's kind of where I want to pick up the text uh, 
uh, because there's a scene that we want to see. We, we really want to see the process that is going on. So let's get the text up in front of us. Um, and we'll, why don't we start in the 25th verse here? And that seems like a, a, a good place. Right after the Father makes that amazing statement, I believe, help me in my own belief, that's sort of a backwards uh, type of discussion. Well, faith is going to return to this discussion later on when the disciples ask Jesus why, why they could not throw him out. But notice in the 25th verse um, at, at where, where we are. And, and when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, now there's already a crowd there, we know that. We're not really sure how this looked. Uh, they might have stepped back just a wee bit or more people might have come anticipating a miracle. But when Jesus uh, and this, this father of the son have this confrontation, apparently the crowd gets the idea that uh, something special is going to happen. Remember, the crowds in Jesus' day were quite fickle. Um, they were curiosity seekers and Quite often they're just looking for another miracle, but the miracles alone will never save anyone. No one is going to be converted to follow Jesus Christ because of something miraculous. Although many people say, oh yeah, if I, Jesus came here and floated things around, of course I'd believe him. No, no, no you wouldn't. You, you, you wouldn't believe in him if that's your attitude. The only true way that faith comes is a gift uh, that God gives those when the heart that is such an unbelieving heart and a blind heart is, is changed. Well, nonetheless, when this crowd came, it almost as if Jesus picks it up, you know, because it really he's not interested in doing magic trick for people, but he is going to save this boy. He is going to heal him. So he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, notice the authority with which Jesus speaks. He has the authority to command this demon to leave the boy, come out of him and never enter him again. Very tender here all of a sudden that he, he casts him out, showing that once Jesus casts out a demon, once Jesus saves someone as he is saving this boy, um, he, he saves them. <laughs> there doesn't, there, there's no going back. Uh, there's no returning for this particular demon. He makes sure that the boy is going to be saved or, or, or the exorcism now is what I'm mixing uh, phrases here. The exorcism is what we're talking about, but symbolically we're, we're talking about when Jesus saves someone from um, their sin. But notice what the demon does in the 26th verse. And crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. The boy is like a corpse. So that most of them said he is dead. Okay, that's the scene you kind of want to see. Um, the demon doesn't come out quietly or nicely uh, or politely. Um, he, he, one thing about evil is that it does not like to be cast out of those that they think they own. Um, Satan thinks that he has a kingdom and he's the king of the kingdom and he, he contends against God. Doesn't like to be reminded that his time is short. Doesn't like to be reminded that he's been cast out of heaven. Doesn't like to be reminded that God is sovereign over him and all of his maniacal dreams that he will be like God or can contend against God. He hates it when he's reminded that that's not true. And so the demon, when he comes out of the boy, convulses him terribly and, and just abuses him. Um, sort of a, a, you know, a last, a parting salvo, if you will. But I think it also, it, it, there's, there's something we should see there is that the evil doesn't give up. You know, when Pharaoh was beaten in Egypt and um, he let the children of Israel go, it wasn't long before he decided, hey, I'm going to get them back and sent his whole army and, and, and after them, which was a, a ridiculous mistake for him to make. And of course, he will pay the price. And there, therein in that story is another uh, example of what we are seeing here. You know, when God removes the evil from us, he removes it doesn't mean the evil is not going to continue fighting, but it is removed as far as the east is from the west. Um, well, after the boy is looking like a corpse on the ground, most of the people around them said, well, the boy's dead. You know, the, the, the demon took the boy's life when he left. But this is, the, this is the beautiful verse. And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. 
and he arose. That's what Jesus does, folks, and we'll get to that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, and then going ahead in the 28th verse, and when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And so um, that brings us to the end of this particular story. Now let's go back. Um, let me find our place here because we're way down in this. We've been uh, making our way through this story for um, quite a few days. Uh, and here we are. All right, I believe we're right here where the boy, the scene that we have in front of us is the boy lying on the ground looking like a corpse. The, 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 the demon has just been exorcised. He has just been driven out. And everyone thinks that the boy is dead. And that's when we get to the verse that I just read you that um, I, I love, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. You see, this is what Jesus does. He lifts people up. Um, think about um, Peter when he was walking on the water. And of course, you know, he looks at the water and he begins to sink. Well, I've given you math, Matthew 14, 31 there. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus grabs him by the hand and lifts him up. Or when the little girl uh, Talitha uh, uh, or, or Tabitha, we'd sometimes call her, who actually had been dead, well, same thing happened. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. Same thing with Peter's mother-in-law when she was sick with a fever from Mark. Um, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and the fever left her and she began to serve them. So Jesus does this and there's picture that is repeated over and over again in the Gospels of Jesus lifting people up. And so this boy is laying there dead or looking like he's dead. And the way I see this in my mind is Jesus has to reach down and grab his hand. It's not like the boy lifts his hand up because the boy is totally dead. Mark that image because he can't move. He's a corpse. But Jesus lifts the boy up. And again, as I see it, when Jesus grabs the hand, there's a jolt in the body as the boy seems to come to life. We know that he wasn't dead. He didn't actually die, but he seems to come to life. And then with joy and with finality, because when Jesus raises someone up to life, they live. Death is gone, um, at least in the, the, in the way that this is seen. And the, the word actually in, in Greek means that, and Jesus set him on his feet. You know, he set him upright. Now the boy arose, uh, a new boy, a new man, if you will, so to speak. Um, now, the underlying word that Jesus, or that Mark uses here, and he arose, is a word that literally means to stand up from a sitting or a reclining position. And, and so that's really the way we see it. We literally see it in our minds. That he was laying on the ground like a corpse and he arose, meaning he stood up from that prone position. But the word itself is quite often used in a different context, same word, same idea, but to talk about those who aren't rising from a sitting or a prone position, but those who are rising from a dead position, meaning they are dead, um, and they, they rise. Now, a resurrection from the dead, I mean, in other words, the same word. Now, it is used both of Christ and of those who are raised up from that dead. And so the symbolism uh, uh, begins at least to point out, and I've already told you that I'm going to talk a little bit about the symbolic look at this picture or this scene before us. Um, and, and I always like to qualify it when I start talking symbolically about a scene. I'm not questioning the historicity of that scene. Um, and I, I don't necessarily know that this entire story is designed to be a symbolic story or a living parable. You know what I mean by a living parable. It's a parable. It tells a story. There's a point. There's a principle to it. 
Um, but it actually happened. It was a real historical event. Um, and, and I can't tell you that that is what this is. Um, and I certainly cannot tell you and would not tell you that this is what was in Mark's mind um, when he wrote it. But regardless, the, the, the salvation symbolism is very obvious here. And, and so we can take a look at the story, and I don't think we're out of line at all, to find symbolic symbolism of redemption. Because the Gospels are filled with stories of people who are blind who are seeing, lame who can walk, lepers who are cleansed, and here a demon possessed and several demon possessed who were cleansed. Each one of those tells us a little bit about the process of redemption. Because when we are redeemed, we're blind, and then all of a sudden we can see. When we are redeemed, even though we are incapable of walking in the ways that the Lord has called us to walk, now all of a sudden we can use our legs and walk. When we were unclean, like a leper, covered with our sins, now all of a sudden we are cleansed and those sins are removed from us. And the, ne the opposite of that is now the evil that possesses people when a demon possession is exercised. Well, that's the way we are because actually we live in the same kind of situation that that boy was. I mean, we may not be so obvious that we have epileptic style fits because the demon is casting us down, we're foaming at the mouth, but when sin has control of us, when sin owns us, well, then we're slaves. Just like this boy was a slave to the demon who was in him and was, was prone for these fits, when we are in our fallen state and evil controls our life, when Satan controls our life, then we're a slave to sin. Jesus, of course, said in John, which I've given you there, John 8, 34, that truly, truly, I say to you, he said, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You remember in that conversation he was having with the pious Jews who said, you know, we're, you know, we're not slaves to anyone, even though they were pretty much slaves to Rome at the, right, at the same time. But you get the point that there, there is a correlation between the evil that enslaves this boy and the evil that... Um, encompasses us when we are lost in sin. Just like the, the boy who was demon possessed and when the demon would cast him into the fire and into the, um, the, the water, obviously th this is not something that that boy wanted to do. So the evil that possessed him forced him to do things that he didn't want to do. And of course, that makes me think immediately of Romans 7 when Paul said, for I do not understand my own actions. Now, if that doesn't ring a bell with you, then I'd like to talk to you because we all are in that situation where we don't understand why we do what we do. Um, going on in that Romans passage, for I do not do what I want to do, but the very thing that I hate. Now, if that's not a picture of that demon-possessed boy being rolling on the ground and frothing at the mouth, I don't know what is. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So just like this boy was um, being destroyed and forced to do things that hurt him and, and brought him physical harm and mental harm, we also, when we are under the influence of sin, we do things that destroy us. And that sin forces us to do things that we, do, we don't want. But when Jesus comes to drive the demon out, and, um, and to drive the demon out of us, what does he do? He gives us a new heart uh, and, and in a sense cast the evil that is in us out and um, uh, uh, puts that heart in there. And of course, we'll find out later that that's something that only Jesus can do. And it takes both, well, let me put it this way, it takes faithful prayer and 
that's where we're going to, to go, na go, go next. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit and the prayer that is the prayer of faith is a prayer that comes from a, a gift of faith when the Holy Spirit uh, redeems the heart. So the, the casting out goes first, right? And then the prayer comes second. And uh, just to press our analogy, it's uh, Jesus cast out the evil that's in us by giving us a new heart. But then notice, again, as I pointed out as we were reading through it, notice that the demon didn't give up that easy, did it? He shrieked and he convulsed. Well, you know, if, if, if you can remember back, if you were like me and, and you had a conversion later on in life and you can remember the, the sort of awkward pain where you could almost feel like there were claws in you that weren't going to let you go and, and, and wanted you to stay in that sinful lifestyle rather than turning your head to begin to follow Jesus. That's, that to me is, is just like this demon convulsing him, uh, 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 not wanting to let the boy go. But of course, that's to no avail because our Lord lifts us up. And when our Lord lifts us up, there is no evil, there's no demon that can keep that from happening. As Paul, I mean, as David says in the Psalms, you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. So I hope that you can see that the whole story is indeed, as so many stories in the Gospels are a beautiful picture of the salvation that Jesus came to bring and the process of salvation. You know, we learn as much about the salvation process. Or I should actually say redemption. That's just another example of how I use salvation incorrectly. Salvation is the total package, actually. Redemption or justification. But what a beautiful picture. We learn as much about the process of redemption um, through these stories of Jesus healing and what happens to those he healed because that's ex actually what the gospel writers are telling us. These are the examples of how Jesus heals both the body and the soul. Um, we, we learn as much about it, the process from them as we do from the didactic teaching of Paul and the others in the epistles that follow. Of course, together we get that great view of the doctrines of redemption. Well, anyway, uh, moving on to the 28th verse, we turn back now to the disciples, all right? Okay, the scene of the, of the exorcism is over, and we read in the 28th verse, And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? What, what was it that kept us from casting out this, this, this demon? Um, we'll notice a couple of things about this. First of all, apparently there was a house nearby. All of a sudden, you know, when I've envisioned this without reading all the way through, I envisioned Jesus up on a lonely mountain coming down in the middle of nowhere. Um, and there's a bunch of people at the base of the mountain and I don't see any houses and things around, but apparently there must have been a community at the base of the mountain because remember, we are probably in between Caesarea Philippi and Capernaum, somewhere northeast, if you will, of Capernaum. And so apparently there is some kind of a, of a settlement there, some place where there are people, because obviously there's a crowd that came from someplace. So there must have been some kind of a, a village or a town at the very bottom of it. Um, and Jesus would regularly, when he traveled about, you would find him regularly staying with someone, staying with in people's houses. Obviously, he didn't have any money, really, except for ministry. Um, and so they didn't stay in, there were no hotels or motels or roadside inns or anything like that. They, you know, towns did have inns, but he, he stayed with people. And, and, and the way that we need to remember that, kind of odd for us because we're so isolated in, in our homes, but Middle Eastern hospitality mandated that a stranger at your door was to be brought in and looked after and giving food, lodging, um, and a bath and, uh, you know, a, a washing of the feet and, and things like that. 
Um, it was actually very intense. Um, the mandate of Middle Eastern, ancient and uh, to a degree modern, but more so in the ancient world, um, of hospitality of strangers. And, and so Jesus would find a place to stay wherever he went. You may remember, and I, I gave you um, uh, out from Matthew, you may remember when Jesus sent his disciples out there in that 10th chapter of Matthew, that great discipleship, sending them out. Um, he, he talked about how, where they were to stay when they went from village to village reading in the, the, the 11th verse of that chapter. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. Uh, not just the physical house, but the people who are there. And, 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 and the, if you will, almost like the aura of that house. Uh, uh, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your word, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town, truly I say to you, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for those towns. So apparently Jesus has found someone in this town who is worthy, whether it is a full-fledged disciple that he knows well, that he would stay whenever he came this way, or whether it is just simply someone who was open to the word that he was teaching and preaching. Um, we don't know, but apparently he finds somebody who is worthy, so he entered into the house. Now, notice that Mark says he entered into the house. Now, we don't know what house it is, so normally we would say a house, but the fact that he says the house kind of means that at least um, Jesus knew where he was staying or, or knew the house that, that, that he was. But when Mark uses that phrase in his gospel and, and he entered into the house, quite often what he is doing, it's not just Mark, it, it's elsewhere as well. Um, this is an indication that some private teaching, some personal teaching is going to take place. They, you know, usually Jesus would be outside standing in a boat off the shore of the Sea of Galilee or in this case coming down off the mountain so there's a crowd outside um, and there are parables either being taught or there's some miracle being worked and then if the disciples are confused by what happened then they'll talk about entering into the house. Like, for instance, back in the seventh chapter of Mark, um, very similar, um, Jesus was actually in a conflict with the Pharisees. I don't know if you remember that. The blue bloods had come and they were upset because the disciples weren't going through that ceremonial cleansing of the hands before they ate. And so they had this discussion and then in the 17th verse, and when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. Okay, so the, the, the disciples want clarification of what happened. And that's when Jesus said to them, then you are also without understanding. Um, it kind of started this whole segment out. And, and I don't know if you remember that theme that I've been bringing up over and over and over again through the last several chapters, that the faith of the disciples is, is lagging behind where it should be. And this was kind of where it started. Um, and Jesus says, then you are also without understanding. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? And so the same situation. And now he goes into the house and the puzzled disciples asked him, well, why do we fail? His disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Why couldn't we cast out this demon? And there's a lesson for us here, and, and so kind of pay attention to the discussion here because I think there's a lesson for each and every one of us, certainly for the disciples and modern day disciples as well. Um, the, uh, remembering that the disciples had already been given the power and authority to cast out demons, remembering that and also remembering that they have already successfully done so. All right, this is not the first encounter that they have had with a demon. And prior to this, whatever they did, they did right. And this time they did it wrong. And that's why we kind of want to see, well, what happened then? 
that didn't happen now. And, the, you know, the disciples are pretty much asking the, the, the same question. Um, in fact, just to reiterate that they had already um, done this in the sixth chapter of Mark, they cast out many demons and anointed many uh, with oil many who were sick and healed them. So they are obviously confused and not a little bit upset that they weren't able to cast this demon out in this position. And I think publicly humiliated, actually, um, because remember the Pharisees were were contending with them and Jesus had to come and uh, bail them out of it. And Jesus is going to kind of tell us in the next verse what actually went on, 29th verse. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Okay, so several things that we want to see. Well, by the way, um, if you're following along in the King James Version, you know that um, they have added and fasting. Uh, and this kind can only be thrown out with prayer and fasting. Well, the better text, the be better uh, copies, the original copies in the Greek don't include fasting. That was really sort of part of the, um, the Vulgate, which uh, the, the version that King James was taken from. So the preferred uh, translation is that they, this kind cannot be thrown out by anything but prayer. Now, there's several things I want you to notice about that. First of all, notice that Jesus says this kind. That's illuminating, isn't it? I don't know if it is to you, but it is to me. There are kinds. That means that all demons aren't alike. That means that all the spirits that trouble us even today that are out in the world destroying lives and, and uh, captivating people and uh, bringing bad things about, causing stumbling blocks, they're not all the same. There are, there are some that are kind, that are more powerful, more evil, more wicked, more disgusting than others. And, and I can't help it. I'm sure it's, it, it's not the same, uh, but you may remember C.S. Lewis's uh, great story, The Screwtape Letters. And there was a whole hierarchy, a whole governmental uh, type of organization of demons and uh, um, um, older demons with, you know, uh, much more power than the younger, you know, sort of rookie demons <laughs> that we saw in that story. But I'm, I'm, that, that, it's illuminating to me that not all evil um, uh, forces, all evil spirits here are the same. They're the heavyweights and they're the lightweights. And this particular one happened to be uh, a heavyweight. And Jesus makes it clear that in order to throw this kind out, this kind of heavyweight demon, that the only way to do it is through prayer. Now, I think that what we should do at this point is we should um, bring in a parallel because Matthew, in his version of this, he says it a wee bit different uh, or a different Lee. Um, um, reading from the 17th chapter of Matthew, the 20th verse, he says, because of your little faith. After the disciples asked him, why couldn't we throw it out? Jesus turns and says, because your faith is little because of your little, now he's talk, not talking quantitatively, but qualitatively when he says that, but because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, in our study of Mark, we've already talked about that. We've talked about the lack of faith or when Jesus says to the man when he's struggling with his faith, uh, believe, help my unbelief, Jesus says that with faith, anything or all things are possible. And, and so we've already discussed the idea of what that means, not that if you just think hard enough and have faith hard enough and believe, 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 you can make mountains move from one spot to another. What Jesus is saying, if it is the will of the Father and that is what he wants to do and you believe in the Father's will and he moves a mountain from one place to another, well, the kind of faith that trusts that the Father's ability to do that is the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about. Now, once again, let's keep in mind that faith or the lack thereof is one of the major themes here in this whole segment, a whole section of Mark. Into this chapter, we're, we're turning. Uh, the things are, are, are going to move on. We're, we're going to start looking um, 
um, towards Jerusalem and towards the, 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 the special problems that are going to exist there. But right now, faith is, is a, a major uh, issue. Now, let's go back to Mark, what Mark says. Uh, Mark says in Jesus that this kind can only be thrown out by prayer. Matthew says that Jesus says this kind can only be thrown out through faith because your faith is so little. That's the reason that you are not able to throw it out. So the question arises, and of course you know, and I tell you all the time, that skeptics love these kinds of things because they love to um, uh, uh, find these kinds of issues. Is this a conflict that Matthew says faith and Mark says prayer? No, not in the slightest. In fact, there's a lesson for us to learn about prayer and faith that both Mark and Matthew are talking about the same thing. They're both talking about faithful prayers, prayers that are prayers of faith. Um, let me give you a principle here about prayer. Um, when prayer is properly done, it is faith in action. In other words, prayer or faith, prayer is actually faith directed towards God because you're praying to God and asking Him or praying that His will be done. So prayer and faith are completely tied together. You can't have prayer without faith. You can't have faith without prayer. I mean, the two are, are, are one and the same in the way that it's being used here. Now, does that mean that all faith is prayerful faith? No. Does it mean that all prayers are faithful prayers? No. But what it means is that in this particular instance, the reason that these disciples were not able to cast out the demons is because of the nature or the faithlessness of their prayers. So we can assume some things. We can assume that the disciples, when they were trying to cast out this demon, prayed. But obviously, they, were, they knew that they had been given this authority, and I would assume that they didn't necessarily think they were going to do it in a vacuum without actually praying to God to, to throw it out. But there was obviously a difference in their prayers because their prayers didn't work, and Jesus' prayer did. So what's the difference? Well, again, we're learning an invaluable lesson in that the prayers that they were praying were not the prayers of faith the way that Jesus has defined faith. In other words, and I keep batting around this before I get to, you know, sort of to my point. In other words, we have learned that true faith is to trust and believe in God's Word. Anything that we can do, we're going to anything we believe in and we trust in will happen is in things that happen in Jesus' name. In other words, all things are possible if we ask for it in the name of Jesus, meaning in His essence, meaning according to His will. And so that all things that we ask in that kind of faith that is indeed in sync with God's will are the things that will necessarily be answered because they are the will of God. And our, our quest is to have a will of our own that is so in sync with the will of God that we want nothing else but the will of God. And therefore, your prayers will always be answered if they are indeed in sync with the will of God. So what that means is that the disciples, when they were praying, were praying, even though they were saying their prayers, they're praying on their own power. And they're not praying the prayers of faith. Because the prayer of faith never wants its own. It always wants the Father's will, the Father's will to be done. And so therefore, even though they might have prayed, they were acting on their own power. They were going through the motions, brothers and sisters, but they were acting on their own power. And that is the great lesson that is here for every single one of us. And that is that on our own, we're nothing. We're incapable of doing anything. We, we're, we're, we're limp rags. We're like the boy laying down on the ground with the total appearance of being dead. 
He cannot possibly save himself. He cannot possibly cast the demon out. The disciples are in the same boat even though they're standing upright. They can't cast that demon out unless they are depending 100% on the power of God. Now, without articulating the, the details of this, we know because of what Jesus said and what he did that the disciples were asking in, in, in a way other than the way that would actually cast the demon out. For instance, probably asking for a rubber stamp, and we do that a lot. We ask that, God, listen, I'm going to do this thing for you, and please bless my, 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 my actions, bless what I do. Lord, together we need to do this. I need you to do this, or I want you to do this, and I'm calling on you and asking on you. I'm asking you to do what I want you to do. I want to cast this demon out. I want to show these people that I can cast this demon out, that I have the authority that Jesus has given me. So come on, God. I want you to help me accomplish, I may call it your will, but what I'm actually asking God to do is accomplish my will. And God doesn't do that. Now, sometimes His will just happens to be our mistaken conception of His will. But so often it is not. And we say, He's not listening to my prayers. He's not answering my prayers. He's, and then what's even worse is the enemy whispers in our world, our ear, because He's not answering your prayers because He's not there. And so the whole thing works opposite of the way that it actually should. These are not the, that's why prayer and faith is, is so, so closely um, to, uh, tied together because when we pray, we pray according to the will of God, trusting entirely that God is going to do it right and therefore accepting humbly and submissively, and this is what's so hard, humbly and submissively whatever he brings, knowing that even though I can't see it and I can't comprehend it, knowing that whatever he brings is good because he's a good God. We have to sometimes lean on our understanding of the nature of God and divorce the entire situation from our circumstances. We have to know that God is good. We have to know that he's compassionate. We have to know that he loves us. I was listening just today, and some of you probably heard the same thing because you listen to RefNet or you listen to Ligonier Ministries, and Dr. Sproul was teaching a, uh, a series in Renewing Your Mind uh, on suffering. And they've really been poignant the last couple of days and the things that, that he has said. But, you know, today he was talking about Job, and he's talking about uh, some of the, uh, of the stories and Jesus, um, um, again, from the Gospel. And he's just making the point that God is the God of suffering, that God allows suffering. And anyone who tells you that God does not allow suffering is not telling you anything about the real God. And when you are going through times of suffering and your prayers are not being answered and you think that they are not being heard, well, the circumstances will destroy you if you, you focus on those circumstances, that what you need to really do is to recognize, to step back and just remember, what do I know about God? What am I positive that I know about Him? What can I take to the bank? And that is when knowing the attributes, knowing the sovereignty of God, knowing the omnipotence, the omniscience, the, the absolute uh, compassion and love and mercy and grace of God, to be so aware of who He is, you know that even though you don't see it, just like Job didn't see it, even though you can't tell what's going on, you're so bowled under by the circumstances that are, that are weighing you down that you trust in the one you know. You trust in Him. And brothers and sisters, that's the prayer of faith. Prayer of faith is not always asking for to be out, to be out from under the, the suffering because guess what? Uh, God's people suffer um, and Jesus suffered. And uh, God is not one that, uh, that protects us 
from suffering. Um, so the, the prayer of faith is something that um, absolutely, uh, um, I believe that um, is one of the great lessons that we learn here. And I left you with one, with, with one other verse, uh, set of verses here, the parallel that we um, that we, uh, we see on this famous, and I make it famous because I repeat it so many times, when Jesus and his disciples are going across to the other side. And the 23rd verse of Matthew 8, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. Now, the scene almost exactly like those nine disciples trying to cast out that demon. The scene is that there's a storm, they're in the boat, the boat's about to sink, but the sailors, the fishermen, the ones who do all the work, Jesus is a carpenter from Nazareth. What does he know about the Sea of Galilee? We're the ones who know the boat. We're going to get this thing to the other side. We're going to uh, accomplish this storm. It's not till they're about to sink that they wake Jesus up. And then, of course, we, we hear, and, and they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the wind and the seas obey him? You see, without Jesus, there's, we, we Christians are the, 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 the weakest, most incapable group of people because we have given up our own power, our own strength. We've divested our own power and our own strength. Now, this is, of course, not true of all Christians and all churches because quite a lot of Christians, they feel that they've got to get out in front of God. But a true disciple, a true Christ follower is one that understands that they are weak and incapable of accomplishing anything that the Lord has called them to do, that Jesus is going to do it all. And as long as he is in the effort, they cannot fail. If it's us trying to do it on our own, it will always fail. And if that's the only lesson you pull from this, then that's a good one, because that's exactly what happened with those nine disciples. They were trying to do it under their own power and having God rubber stamp it. Exactly how that played out, I don't know. But that's basically it. They were having God rubber stamp what they wanted to do. And God doesn't do that. It's, it's for us to, with his power, follow him and be part of that great strength. Um, so that brings us into the end of the, um, that particular passage. So let me close us in prayer here. And let me give you an important announcement uh, after this. Okay? And... Um, um, so don't, don't leave until after I, 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 I close in prayer. Father, thank you for the pictures that you give us in these amazing stories. Um, it's just, um, just, they're just wonderful. They teach us lessons, and I pray that we are willing to learn those lessons. And I pray that we are willing to recognize that it is the prayers of faith that, um, that we need to have, always, every single one of them, and no matter what situation we're in, that we need to turn to your power and your strength, find our hope and our, 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 our future in you, um, and, and that we keep going back to recognizing who you are, finding the wall in the darkness sometimes when uh, all the world closes in on us, and just remembering that we do serve a great God. We serve the all-powerful God. We serve the God who had never let us go through one minute of suffering if it was not his will and if it wasn't a good purpose to it. And so, Lord, we just pray that we will take that to heart and allow it to shape us and shape our, our present and our future. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, I didn't say anything about this before because I really wanted to see how the text that I had for tonight flowed and um, we made it through it. I had wanted to make it out of the way through the ninth chapter because that's really a turning point in Mark, but um, I'm looking at the, the passages that we have, I see at least uh, a month uh, uh, there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this now. I'm gonna um, momentarily bring our study of Mark to a, uh, we're gonna pause for um, uh, at least a month, um, and for no other reason than, um, um, I'll just be honest with you, I need some time, uh, I need some rest. So we're just going to take a pause. I usually kind of pause in the Bible studies uh, during the summer. 
Um, so we're just going to take a, a pause here. We've already paused on Wednesday night, although Wednesday night's not really a pause because we are teaching um, the new members class. Um, this is not going to be a complete pause either because there's some other things that we want to do, like for instance, get back uh, into some outreach uh, with uh, Life Explorer. But as far as teaching this for the summer, I'm going to go ahead this evening since it's the last of June. Um, I'm going to bring this to a momentary pause and we will talk about um, when we'll restart it um, and how that might be in the fall. So um, I hope that if uh, you see others who are normally part of this, I know you have no way of knowing who is on and who's not on right now. Um, by the way, I'm about halfway through with the chat room. Um, I just have to complete the code and we'll have a chat. Um, <laughs> however rudimentary it is. Um, but uh, we will start back up and exactly the way it's going to look, I can't tell you. But uh, I do want to thank you. You have been very faithful, those of you who are tuned in now. I know that you've been very faithful about staying with this Bible study. I know it started out to be one thing and it ended up to be another. Um, but I, I think it's been a, a real blessing just to make our way through the Galilean ministry of Jesus. Uh, again, almost finished, but um, it just the, the timing is such that I think that we need to sort of go ahead and make the break here. So thank you, and uh, thank you so much for being um, part of this. Uh, don't uh, we, we will take several weeks um, uh, before we restart it, so I'll make sure that we, through the various um, avenues, whether at church or whether um, through email, I tell you when and, and the way that it will look when we start back up. So let me uh, go ahead and return us to return your evening to you. And once again, God bless you. And I thank you very much for, um, for your faithfulness and your concern and interest in the Word of God. Lord bless you. Have a good evening.